Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming. Thank you, Dave, for coming. We're about to start, if, if that's okay with you. Good, we're, good, good, we're, <laughs> oh, golly. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, it is a special time every year that we get to celebrate, the, in particular, the death and burial and resurrection of Christ. Uh, it should be in our minds always throughout the year, right? Every Friday should be Good Friday. And yet there is a time in which we should specially celebrate and commemorate what our Savior has done for us. And tonight we get to do that. So if you would join me in prayer, uh, I will open our time and then I will let our brother Derek take us from there. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the precious gift that he is, our dear Savior, who loved us even to the end, who loved his own who were in the world even to the point of dying upon a cross. Lord, we thank you that our sins are fully atoned for in his work, that there is no question in our minds that maybe that sin slipped by, but he declared to tell us that it is finished. Not it is partially done, not it is mostly done, but it is finished finished. The end to which you created the world was accomplished in his work on the cross. And we thank you, Lord, for that precious work. We thank you also that your spirit has applied that redemption to our hearts. We thank you that your spirit is at work within us and continues to work to sustain us, to preserve us, to cause us to stay in your love. Lord, we thank you for the assurance that we have that you have loved us before the foundation of the world and there's nothing that we can do to change that. And there's nothing that we can do to cause you to loosen your grasp around us. Lord, tonight we pray that we would uh, think deeply and, uh, and humbly about what you have done and that we would marvel and be in awe. It's in your wonderful, precious name that we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to read these words from William Perkins while you all stand and get ready for us to sing. The serious consideration of this that the very Son of God himself suffered all the pains and torments of hell on the cross for our sins, is the most effectual means to stir up our hearts to a godly sorrow for them. Every man must be settled without doubt that he was the man that crucified Christ, that he is to be blamed as well as Judas, Herod, Pontius Pilate, and the Jews, his sins were the nails, spears, and thorns that pierced him. Amen. We're going to start with Behold Our God. I think back one slide, Krista. Starts at Who is Held? Thank you. Who has held the oceans in his hands? Who has numbered every grain of sand? Kings and nations tremble at his voice. All creation rises to rejoice. Behold our God, seated on his throne. Come, let us adore him. Behold our King, nothing can compare. Come, let us adore Him. Who has given counsel to the Lord? Who can question any of His words? Who can teach the one who knows all things? Who can fathom all this wondrous deeds? Behold our God, 
seated on his throne come let us adore him behold our king nothing can compare come let us adore him who has felt the nails upon his hands bearing all the guilt of sinful man God eternal humble to the grave Jesus Savior risen now to reign behold our God seated on his throne come let us adore him behold our king nothing can compare come let us adore behold our god seated on his throne come let us adore him behold our king nothing can compare come let us adore him alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid crown firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are stilled when striving cease my comforter my all in all here in the love of christ i stand in christ alone who took on flesh fullness of God in helpless faith this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as Jesus died the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of christ i live there in the ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again amen and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me for i am his and he is mine bob with the precious blood of christ No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of 
of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I stand. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I stand. Well, you may be seated. It was only two songs, Tim. Come on. Turn in your Bibles to Numbers chapter 6, or you can read from the screen. Tonight we're going to be jumping around quite a bit, but uh, uh, we're going to start in Numbers chapter 6. Let me pray. Father, we thank you that Noah... Sin, neither principalities, nor powers, nor heights, nor depths can ever separate us from the love of Christ and your love for us through him. Lord, we pray that as we continue and open your word tonight, that our hearts would be touched and we would be affected by what you have done for us. Lord, we thank you for these precious truths that we are about to look at, these awe-inspiring truths, these pride-shattering truths, these humbling truths. Lord, may your spirit work as he pleases and wills in our lives, and may we grow in our fondness and our affection towards our dear Savior, Jesus. We love you, Lord, and it's in your precious, wonderful name that we pray. Amen. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. These are common words, familiar words, comforting words. This is perhaps one of the greatest blessings in all of Scripture. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he proclaim his goodness upon you. May he commit to do good for you. And may he keep you in his grasp. May you not wander away, but may he keep you in his hand. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with favor. May he shine forth in his radiant beauty and majesty to your hearts. May he be gracious to you. May he give you all that you do not deserve. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. May he look with favor. May he look with a favorable smile and a, a kind look upon your, your, you. May he give you peace. May he give you a, a shalom. May he give you a fullness, a completeness. Not just a lack of conflict, but, but a completeness and, and a wholeness that, that makes you complete before him. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Comforting words from our uh, older testament. But this greatest blessing is only possible because of the greatest curse. And this is perhaps a theme that has been lost in, in much of modern day American Christianity. The, the theme of the curse in the cross the theme of the curse in the atonement. For you see, in, in Genesis 3, we find that man and woman sinned, and what did God do? He cursed the ground because of them. Because of them, sin entered into the world, and because of sin, it brought forth death. And so under this curse, there is misery, there is sorrow, there are pains throughout all of creation, and, and so much so that all of creation groans in longing and anticipation for the revealing of the sons of God. We are faced and surrounded by incredible sorrow and an incredible curse. How could we possibly say this greatest blessing 
How could we even think that the Lord would bless us and keep us when we're surrounded by so much suffering? When we ourselves contribute to so much of that suffering as well? When we ourselves contribute so much sin into this world, into our lives, into our families, into our workplaces, when we constantly violate the law of God, how can this blessing be possible? And I would humbly offer to you, it is because of the curse of the Son of God that we may be blessed. Let's flip this blessing on its head. Let's flip this. Yahweh curse you and forsake you. Yahweh make his face to glare upon you and remove his grace from you. Yahweh cast down his countenance upon you countenance upon you, and remove his peace from you. Harsh words. And it is this curse that our Father placed upon his Son on the cross. The the curse motif in the atonement that Christ took the curse for us. We find this in Galatians chapter 3. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, we read, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Christ redeemed us. He bought us. He exchanged us. He took the curse from us, the curse of the law, by becoming the very curse that we deserve where God would have given nothing but harm, nothing but horrible things, nothing but punishment, nothing but wrath, the Son stepped in and took that for us. Where we deserved the results of a curse because we transgressed the law, we still do transgress the law, and we will continue to transgress the law until we are finally dead and and glorified. He took the curse of the law by becoming that very curse for us. For it is written, Curse is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Now let's go back to this horrible, greatest curse for a moment from number six. We're going to look at each one of these clauses, each one of these statements, each one of these curses, and we're going to look at how this was laid upon the Son of God for you, for me. We're going to see how God cursed him so that we might receive the blessings of the Father. We see this early on in in the book of Leviticus, this, this imagery we see in the Day of Atonement. We see two sacrifices being made and offered on this wondrous and awful and terrible day The first sacrifice was of an unblemished lamb, a perfect lamb, a lamb without spot or wrinkle, a lamb that was perfect specimen. It would have won grand champion in the lamb shows if they had such things in those days. And after a long process of purification, the high priest would slit this lamb's throat and he would gather the blood in a container, in a vessel, And for the one and only time that year, he would enter into a space that was prohibited from any living person except for this one day and for this one man. Tradition tells us that they would even tie bells around the hem of his robes and and a rope around his legs. So if he didn't do the purification correctly or if he messed up inside the holiest place, and if they heard the bells stop jingling, then they could slowly pull his body out from the Holy of Holies because he had been struck dead by God's glory and holiness. That was the first sacrifice. The first sacrifice was this unblemished lamb, and the high priest would walk into the Holy of Holies with the Ark of the Covenant before him, with the cherubim on either side, and in the middle was the mercy seat. And he would take the blood of the lamb and he would sprinkle it upon the mercy seat of God on the Ark of the Covenant. I wonder at times what that ark looked like after years and years of this ceremony and of this celebration. Was it purified because of the holiness of God? 
and automatically cleaned, or was it cake with decades of blood upon it? Regardless, this first lamb represented the propitiation. It was the appeasement of God the Father. The, the justice of God demands a sacrifice. The justice of God demands appeasement, or else the, the wrath of God will follow upon those that have provoked God's justice. And in this first sacrifice, we see the high priest coming before the, the mercy seat of God and offering a substitution a substitutionary death, a lamb that did nothing wrong, a lamb that had no sin in it, a lamb that was perfect in beauty and shape and form and was killed on behalf of the people. This represents the propitiation of God, the satisfaction of God's justice. And often we stop there and we forget to consider the second sacrifice. And it's a little bit of a confused term because it wasn't actually sacrificed, and yet it was indeed sent off to its own death. Leviticus chapter 16, verses 20 through 22 read, And when he has made an end of the atoning for the holy place and the tent of meeting and the altar, he, that is, the high priest, shall present the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat, and he shall confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions, all their sins. And he shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. The goat shall bear all their iniquities on itself to a remote area, and he shall let the goat go free in the wilderness. In the second sacrifice, we see the expiation of God of our sins, the, the taking of sins, placing them upon someone else, and then that creature carrying those sins into the outer darkness, into the wilderness, into the place where the curse is found. We see the goat carrying the sins of the people out away from the camp, out away from the presence of the Father out, away from the presence of the tabernacle, away from the Holy of Holies, away from the very presence of God, those sins are cast as far as the east is from the west. We see in this beautiful picture the very atonement of Christ himself. We see Christ as the lamb that was without blemish, who was given, offered to appease the wrath and justice of the Father. We call this penal substitutionary atonement, that the wrath of God that was building up for the sins of his people were placed upon the shoulders of his perfect son. And then the wrath of God was poured out upon that son's shoulders. And then we also see that the son is the goat in which all of our sins are placed upon him and he is carried, he carries his cross into the outer limits of the city, away from the temple, away from the walls of Jerusalem to the place uh, called the skull. And there he is crucified for all to walk by and wag their heads and mock him and scorn him and deride him. If he could saved others, why doesn't he save himself? not knowing that the very reason why he could save others is that he does not save himself. We see later on in Hebrews chapter 13, we have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sins are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. You see, throughout the Old Testament, this idea of outside the camp was to say that you were distanced from God, that you were under the curse of God, that you were separate from God, that you were out of fellowship with God, that you were no longer a part of the commonwealth of God, that you were removed from the splendor and goodness and kindness of God. And so too, Christ was taken outside of the city, outside the gate, in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. He was put under the curse of God so that we might receive the blessing of God. 
In Mark, we read in verse 21 of chapter 15, And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him outside the city to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. He was taken outside the city to be a byword, a a person of derision for the people who walked by and would mock him. He was under the curse of God. Going back to our greatest curse, we see that Yahweh has cursed him. But what's more, Yahweh forsook him. May the Lord curse you and forsake you. In Psalm chapter 2, we get a glimpse into the mind of Christ on the cross. Many scholars say that Jesus on the cross says, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And oh, he's just referencing the second psalm to show that this is a fulfillment of prophecy. That's a near blasphemous statement. In reality, the psalmist, David, is looking ahead and seeing the inner torment and struggle of the Son of God And when he writes, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. In this moment, we see a a profound mystery The Trinity, the the relationship between Father, Son, and Spirit that has existed for all of eternity past is somehow divided where the Father turns His face away from the Son. Where the Father forsakes the Son. The Father could not keep Him. The Father could not bless Him. He could not keep Him. Rather, the Father must curse Him and He had to forsake Him. He forsook the Son. He turned His face away from Him. For all of His life, Jesus, when He went through difficult times, He could always turn to His disciples and say to them, you may not agree with me, you may not know what I am saying, you may desert me, but I know that my Father and I have a close relationship. But in this moment, He could not say that. In this moment, the Son was truly alone. We all go through seasons of sorrow, seasons of loneliness, seasons of uh, solitude. But we as Christians can always say, but at least I have my Father to comfort me. At least I have the work of Jesus to help me in this time. Jesus had none of this. In this moment, the eternal triune God had forsaken Jesus Christ. May the Lord curse you and forsake you. May the Lord make his face to glare upon you. In Matthew 27, we read of what happens to the created order when the Father turns his face away from the Son. When the Father who was in perfect fellowship with the Son, turns his face away from him and and removes the the countenance, the, the kindness, the shining glory that was reflected in the Son and was created in the in the second person of the Trinity. We see in Matthew 27, now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over the, all the land until the ninth hour. You see, when the Father turned his countenance away from the sun, the sun refused to shine. When the Father turned His face from the S-O-N sun, the S-U-N could not shine. The very created order could not function as it was designed. For the very Creator was not functioning in the way that He was always functioning. 
And from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, man is calling Elijah. Take a moment to contemplate that every one of these men who were passing by were good Jewish boys who learned their Old Testament. They memorized their Old Testament. They heard Psalm 2 over and over and over again growing up. They heard it over and over and over again every Saturday when they would attend the Sabbath and, and the synagogue. They would hear the Psalms read over and over and over again. And when they clearly hear Psalm 2 quoted, they refuse to believe it. And they mock him and they scorn him and say, well, this man is calling Elijah. The hardness of heart of these people. But the curse of God gets even worse. May the Lord curse you and forsake you. May the Lord make his face to glare upon you and remove his grace from you. Indeed, from Isaiah 53, we see surely he has borne our griefs and he has carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities and upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. There was no grace given to him by the Father. There was no kindness shown by him to him from the Father. Rather, the full curse of God was placed upon his shoulders. He has borne our grief. He has carried our sorrows. And what did we do? We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. When we look through the history of the Christian church, there were many martyrs who were crucified by the Romans. And what was their response by and large? Generally, they went to the cross joyful. Generally, they went to the cross singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. They went to the cross knowing and delighting and glorying in the fact that they could die in a manner like their Savior. Can we honestly say that the captain of our salvation is weaker than those who have followed him? When he is in the garden, broken and sweating drops of blood, and he does not want to go to the cross, he does not desire it, and in fact he dreads it with every fiber of his being. He pleads with his Father, If there's any way, let this cup pass from me. What made it different between Christ and those Christians who were crucified in the Colosseum? It is exactly this. He has borne our grief. He has carried our sorrows. We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crucified for our iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. Yahweh removed all grace and, and instead poured out his very violent anger, his wrath, his, his violent anger against all the sins that you have committed past, present, and future all of the sins of all of the people who would ever be saved by Jesus were placed upon his shoulders. And leading up to that, it was too much for the man Jesus Christ to bear. And yet he still went for you and for me. May the Lord curse you and forsake you. May the Lord make his face to glare upon you and remove his grace from you. May the Lord cast down his countenance upon you. 2 Corinthians 5.21 Him, the gospel in one verse, right? For our sake, for your sake, for Tom's sake, for Ben's sake, he made Jesus to be sin 
who knew no sin. So that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. This, brothers and sisters, is the gospel in a single verse. For our sake, for us, on our behalf, the Father made the Son to be sin. For us, the Son became our sin. Your sin is what Jesus became in those three hours upon the cross. With the result that in Jesus, in Christ, when we are united with him, we might become the very righteousness of God. Is this not blessed news to us? Does this not give you a balm to your heart? But within this text, we see that he became sin who knew no sin, and he bore the weight of that sin. One of my favorite, favorite pastors, theologians, men of church history, R.C. Sproul said these words, The Bible tells us that God is too holy to even look at sin. He cannot bear to look at this, con- at this concentrated, monumental conden- condensation of evil, and his eyes are averted from his son. The light of his countenance is turned off. All blessedness is removed from his son whom he loved, and in its place was the full measure of the divine curse. It was as if there was a cry from heaven, excuse my language, but I can be no more accurate than to say that it was as if God, Jesus heard the words, God damn you. Because that's what it meant to be cursed, to be damned, to be under the anathema of the Father. The Son was damned in our place. The Son bore the wrath that we deserve. The Son took the curse for us. Now there are some who would say that this is a classic classic example of divine child abuse. This is an example of an abuser abusing his son. A couple problems with that. First off, a child who is abused has no choice in the matter. Jesus willingly went to the cross for you. An abuser abuses out of hatred and selfishness and, and loathing and, 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 and sin. But the Father poured out his wrath out of love for you. Can you imagine your child going through a difficult circumstance and and you making it even worse for the sake of another person? And yet that is exactly what the Father has done for you if you are in Christ. The Father poured out his wrath upon the Son so that you might live. The Father turned away his face as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Yahweh curse you and forsake you. May the Lord make his face to glare upon you and remove his grace from you. May the Lord cast down his countenance upon you and remove his peace from you. Again, Isaiah gives us these gripping words. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Start over at the beginning of that. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. It pleased the Lord to crush the Son. Not in a sort of gleeful delight, but in a sense that it would accomplish his purposes. It would bring his will to pass, and it would redeem many sons to glory. 
It was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put Jesus to grief for you. And when Jesus' soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall see his brothers. This is why he is not afraid to call us brothers and sisters. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of Christ's soul he shall see, and yet he shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. For three hours of history, there was conflict between the first and the second members of the Trinity. For three hours, the Father removed his peace from the Son. For three hours, the Son was a curse for us. Our Lord Jesus Christ went to a cross. He died upon that cross. And at the end, he proclaimed, it is finished. So we remember this time in the full confidence that what he went to do, he did. And this is where we can be comforted, we can be excited, because the second member of the Trinity, God himself, was a sacrifice for us, was bearing the wrath of the Father for us. And if he did that, then there is nothing that can snatch us out of his hands. Because he was cursed for us, we might be blessed. Going back to Numbers chapter 6, we can read it as such. The Lord cursed him so that they may bless you. And he forsook him so that they may keep you. Yahweh made his face to glare upon the sun so that they both may make their faces to shine upon you. And he removed his grace from the Christ so that they may be gracious to you. Yahweh cast down his countenance upon the sun so that they may lift up their countenance upon you. And he removed his peace from the sun so that they may give you peace. Now with the remainder of our time, I would like for us to watch a video, a short clip of a a piece that was put together. I think it's an absolutely beautiful uh, clip, or it's 10 minutes long. And then we'll close our time together. God and Father chose you in me before the foundation of the world that you should be holy and blameless before him. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. In love, I would be slain for you. And by my blood, I would ransom you for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, my love, my beautiful one. I have made and I will bear, I will carry and I will save, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Yet I stubbornly followed my own evil heart and was determined to go after filth. I gave my
myself to many lovers, lusting after other gods and bowing down to them. Yes, I prostituted myself to them, and still I was not satisfied. And still was not satisfied. And still was not satisfied. I abandon you, the fountain of living water, and instead dug out for myself cracked cisterns that could hold no water. Therefore, my anger was kindled against you, and I cried out to you, O oh, adulterous wife, who received strangers instead of her husband, how long will you despise me? And how long will you refuse to believe in me in spite of all I have done? But your sin was written with a pen of iron. With a point of diamond, it was engraved on the tablet of your heart. For my own name's sake, I deferred my anger. For the sake of my praise, I restrained it from you. And in all your affliction, I was afflicted. I have made and I will bear. I will carry and I will save. And underneath are the everlasting arms. encompassed me beyond number. My sins overtook me so that I could not see. I was dead in my trespasses and sins, following the course of the world, carrying out the desires of my body and my mind, and by nature, I deserved your wrath, just like everyone else. I did not know the way of peace, and there was no fear of God before my eyes. And so, I became flesh and dwelt with you. And I bore your sins in my own body. iniquity and this is love I gave myself up for you as the wrath absorbing sacrifice for your sins so that you saw my glory glory as of the only begotten son from the father full of steadfast love and faithfulness. Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Keeping steadfast love for thousands. Forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin. But who will by no means leave the guilty unpunished? Lord, and my God, upon you was the punishment that brought me peace, and by your wounds I am healed. I have made, and I will bear. I will carry, and I will save. And underneath are the everlasting arms. I died, and behold, 
I am alive forevermore. So now rejoice and exult with all your heart, my beautiful one. I have taken away the judgments against you. I have cleared away your enemies. I, your King, Yahweh, am in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. I will not fear, for my Maker is my husband. You have redeemed me. You have called me by name. I am yours. You are mine. And when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Because of your steadfast love, I am not consumed. Your mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. What will separate you from my love? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, all these will work together for your good. For behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. My heart and my flesh may fail, but you are the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And when you pass through the valley of the shadow of death, fear no evil for I will be with you. Even there, your hand will lead me, and your right hand will hold me. I have made, and I will bear. I will carry, and I will save. And underneath are the everlasting arms. as your people and you as my God. Arise, my love, my beautiful one. Behold, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, and the springtime has come. For my love is stronger than death. I have made and I will bear. I will carry and I will save. I am your dwelling place for all eternity. And underneath are the everlasting arms. do not know the will of their master that you have called us friends and you have drawn us close to you you have made a way you have saved us you are saving us and you will save us we long for that day when we may see him face to face and we may with all of our hearts without the inhibitions of sin, trip us up to stumble us. Proclaim you are my Lord and my Savior. 
We thank you for the nails upon his hands. The spear that pierced him through. The crown of thorns upon his head. We thank you that love has none than this. That one would lay down his life for us. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.